everybody, it's Dr. Eric Ball Cabbage, and we're back for another episode of Thyroid Answers Podcast. And of course, always joining me on the podcast is my co-host is Dr. Erica Riggleman. Dr. Riggleman, how are you today? Doing great. I'm excited for this podcast today. Yeah, we have a, 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 a guest on again. Our guest today is, is Reed Davis. He's the founder of Functional Diagnostic Nutrition. Uh, Reed, welcome to the podcast. How are you today? I'm doing fantastic, thank you. It's a little cloudy here in California. I'm not used to that, but otherwise having a great day so far. Well, you, I guess you need to get used to a little, um, a little cloudiness because it's we're uh, we're on the East Coast and we have plenty of cloudiness, uh, but the sun does come out. So, anyway, we're going to talk to you a little bit about um, your background, what you do, what you founded, and then we're going to get into uh, thyroid physiology. So, first of all, you know we ask most of our guests is, uh, what's your background? You're not a medical doctor, right? You're not a functional medicine doctor. Um, what's your background? And, and uh, yeah. tell us a little bit about how you got into this space of functional medicine. Yeah, well, thanks for that. No, I'm not a physician. I actually found out that was to my advantage when I started over 20 years ago in a clinic. I had come out of the environmental field. Environmental law was my background, and I was saving the planet air birds bees water trees just really working hard at that and i started to turn my attention to well if the environment's so bad for these animals and things then what's it doing to people including me and so around the year 1999 as i said you know i went to work in a wellness center in southern california now it was based in chiropractic and acupuncture and other modalities and i was really hired to to run the place but the the owner of chiropractors was getting her diplomat in nutrition and said i could go along with her as her assistant and then I could work on her patients in between classes, which was a phenomenal and amazing opportunity. And Doc, I, I fell in love with the clinical side. I just fell in love with working with the clients or patients one-on-one -on -one and trying to help them from a nutritional uh, aspect. So we had the chiropractic and acupuncture and nutrition and other modalities and things. And I found out real quickly that just nutrition alone uh, at the time it was being taught was was mostly about just supplementation. And I just felt like a supplement salesman. And I was, um, you know, replacing drugs with supplements, which is great because they're less toxic. And But they take longer to work. And there was just other issues around it that I wasn't satisfied with. And this is the other problem. Everyone walking in the door just about was – uh, still had their original complaints after having seen five or eight or even 10 other practitioners. So they got to see me first and I was just blown away with that. And you guys know what I'm talking about that, you know, they've been to a doctor, they were told sometimes nothing's wrong with you. Your blood work looks normal and yet they feel like crap, you know, and they look like crap, some of them. And, and I, I determined at that point that I was going to, be the last guy they needed to see. Now, that was pretty naive. I had no medical background, but I was a really good researcher. Again, the environmental law gave me a lot of good talents and skills that I was able to transfer. And also at the same time, I was going to a lot of chiropractic seminars and lectures and things. And back then, chiropractors were starting to be on the cutting edge of functional medicine. It wasn't called that back then. It was just alternative medicine. Then it became complementary, and then it became integrative. And now it's called functional medicine. But, so I started running labs on people, saliva, urine, blood stool, 20 years before, you know, there was the word functional medicine. And I got really good at it, uh, learning what are the underlying causes and conditions. And after running thousands of labs on thousands of people, I identified some critical healing opportunities that were common no matter what that person's complaints were. So whether they had fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue or irritable bowel or PCOS or, or any of these things, they all had something else in common. And it was the hormones, the immune system, digestion, detoxification, some other pathways that could actually be easily tested. You can look for those healing opportunities. And then 
it took me a few years also to work out that it's not just nutrition and adjusting their necks and maybe getting some acupuncture, done, that they really needed a holistic lifestyle program to be developed for them. So that's what's founded, that's the background. You know, I did that for eight or 10 years, just really running thousands of labs, thousands of people, and then uh, studying the, the commonalities. What are the patterns that existed? And it's no surprise to you guys that the people working at the underlying causal levels using the functional lab work were the ones who got better as long as they went home and did the things we asked them to do. I mean, every chiropractor would tell you that it's, it's you know, coming in for your adjustments and treatments is great, but it's what you do at home that matters in between having good posture, doing your exercising, your stretching, things like that. And it became, that was the model I used, the chiropractic model of, you know, you have this innate healing ability. We need to nurture that while we remove any interference. And I just expanded it past chiropractic to include the, their entire environment, everything in their environment. And therefore it's, a, it's an epigenetic program. Okay. So if, so you, you started working at chiropractic office, you started running a bunch of tests, you're kind of a self-taught um, nutrition expert. And then at some point in time, you develop something called functional diagnostic nutrition. So what is, what is that? And uh, give us a little uh, understanding of how that came about. Yeah, thank you. So first of all, I'll say, yes, yeah, you could say self-taught, but I was a monster uh, to these labs. I mean, they, they wondered who the, who the heck are you? And because I was always on the phone with their clinical advisors. And we also had a DO in our office and the chiropractors that I work with. So I, I had a, a mentorship team that was unbelievable. Again, not too many people get the chance to have to run that many labs, have that much free access to patients galore. I was also good at getting new patients, but um, and then the mentorship that I had. So I had tremendous mentorship, and yet you know I was able to fill in the blanks, like do my own, make my own observations and things, and that's what the, turned into what we call functional diagnostic nutrition. So it's functional, it's how you're functioning. It's diagnostic, not medical diagnosis, but just running labs, using the information for healing opportunities. What's out of balance? What ratios are we looking at here? And things like that. How's the digestive system working, the immune system, the detoxification pathways and things. So it's only diagnostic, like a, maybe an auto mechanic would, would run diagnostics or a computer serviceman would run diagnostics and then fix whatever's wrong. It's not medical diagnosing. And then nutrition, because I was a nutritionist, you know, in training, and I just called it that. It's really more nurturing, functional, diagnostic, and nurturing would be a good way to put what, and it's just known now as FDN. And I have trained 3,000 people, they're called FDN practitioners. And that I started 12 years ago. It's, it's, it's an amazing tribe of people. I didn't know there'd be a tribe. I just held a weekend seminar and to teach and it was really caught on and now it's a full-blown online uh year long or six you can do it in six months a uh, certification process to be able to run the labs and use the protocols and uh people are out there doing some amazing work working together with chiropractors and, and other uh, allied health professionals what what particular practitioners are in your program? I know you mentioned the DCs, and but what other practitioners do you have in in your program? Well, it's interesting that you know I started teaching the lay practitioners like myself, just do gooders who really want to help but don't have the training to run labs and look at them again, not using any medical diagnosis, but use the data to identify healing opportunities. So it was a lot of nutritionists, people like similar backgrounds to mine. Uh, but personal trainers, you know, there's some of those that are really smart into the physiology and things. They're learned freaks too. They just want to study and learn. And then we started catching on with some chiropractors, some acupuncturists. We were uh, approved for uh, relicensing credits uh, for acupuncture. Some of the things we've since been accredited by the American Association of Drugless Practitioners. Um, they, uh, every graduate of mine is board eligible for their HHP, holistic health practitioner status. And Things. So, you know, all that has developed along the sides of just teaching, 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 expanding the course. So it's every kind of allied practitioner. We even have some medical doctors who want to practice outside their state. 
and they are finding that my uh, program works because we can run labs anywhere, anytime, any place. Through through if you get certified, and you can run run these labs. So um, it's all that. You know, it's just just people who want to help others and do some good in the world. And most of them have had some kind of personal health challenge, I'll say, uh, that they overcame or are overcoming uh, using the process, the, the program. Okay. Great. So if we're talking about, this is the Thyroid Answers podcast, so people are coming here for um, to get some understanding or get answers to questions that they have about thyroid physiology. Um, we're, our, our take on thyroid physiology is probably a little bit different than than most, um, but we have a hypothyroidism is a is a major problem you know, here and and outside the U.S. But what do you see? Where, what's your take on thyroid physiology? Why do you think we see so many people struggling with hypothyroid symptoms and hypothyroid conditions? It's a really good question, and you know, I'll throw it into one big heap at first. And I read uh, in 2001 in um, a naturopathic magazine that, that stress was involved in about 80% of all doctors' visits, that stress was somehow related. You know, a huge number of those, obviously, for thyroid symptoms. And so um, then, then it turns out that like stress is the actual underlying cause a stress of some sort uh, in about 50% of those cases. So um, I started studying stress and all the various uh, things that happen downstream. And stress is an interesting, uh, you know, we all kind of think we know what that means, but I've just really expanded on what stress is. It, of course, it's the mental, emotional. People think right away that they've got problems with spouses or kids or money or the job they don't like and there's existential angst from not having a purpose in your life and just this mental emotional sort of spiritual stuff that can cause downstream a lot of problems physiologically that can actually affect starts with the the brain and in this uh, hypothalamus pituitary thyroid axis or the hp adrenal axis or the hp ovarian axis and so on so you get this stress but there's all, obviously, I worked in a chiropractic office. I saw people coming in with physical stress and trauma from weakness and bad posture and repetitive motion and car accidents and sports injuries and just stuff that piles up on you year after year after year. So people are in pain and limited range of motion. That has the same kind of stress response. So whether it's mental, emotional, whether it's physical trauma, things. Then, of course, I came from an environmental background. There's 80,000 chemicals outside that have an effect on us and then your body makes its own chemicals it, it produces waste products that i just call that biochemical and chemical stress so i pretty much categorize it as the the mental emotional the physical and trauma built up and then this chemical biochemical stressors and all of that leads to chaos i actually i think i coined the phrase metabolic chaos well naturally you're gonna have health problems and depending on the individual and weak links in metabolism, I mean, it's, it's very complex. They could show up in your office with characteristic thyroid problems. In other words, they've, they're tired, they're fatigued, they have weight they can't get rid of, their hair might be thinning, cold, uh, or even numb extremities. Constipation's a huge one. Feeling sad and blue. Well, that sounds like thyroid. And so the, the clinical diagnosis, it would be thyroid. You could even run a thyroid test and find out that, you know, their TSH is high, their T3, T4 is low. And so you pat yourself in the back, I found your problem is thyroid. It's, that's only a part of it. And it might actually be very far downstream from all the causal factors that led a person to that uh, area. And so remember, I'm not a physician. I'm not going to diagnose hypothyroidism. I'm going to say there's metabolic chaos. Um, we, we need a program that's going to reduce stress in every way it could be identified. And you have to eat right. You have to go to bed on time. You have to exercise and probably take a handful of supplements every day too. Uh, and, and so it really becomes an, uh, an epigenetic treatment plan if you want I, I don't even like calling it treatment but it's just a way if you lived yourself or ate yourself into a problem you can live and eat yourself out of that problem 
So I take a very broad stance when it comes to whether it's hypothyroidism, hypogonadism, you know, any kind of hormone imbalance. And then that same uh, model or way of thinking, it'd be the same whether it was your immune problem, leaky gut and all these things. I mean, it, it all started <clears throat> a long time ago. Yeah, most no, cases. I, I agree. And you can't get healthy in the same environment that you got sick in. And so sometimes people really have to evaluate what's, what's actually going on in their life and make those necessary changes. And sometimes it's, it's not the easy ones. It's the diet. It's the, you know, working on the stress. Maybe it's things you've got to get rid of in your life that you're, you don't want to face. I know you brought up one big point that, that we've talked about here on the podcast before is going to be the foods you eat. Um, what sort of diet do you recommend or what kind of diet or foods do you see correlate with thyroid issues often? Well, you know, other than um, maybe tyrosine and um, iodine deficiencies, I don't see a real uh, high correlation as long as you're eating correct for your genetic type. There's, there's, we, we call it metabolic typing, but there is a correct diet for each person. You just have to know how to find it. So it, it could start with macronutrient ratios, the right amount of protein, fat, and carbs. Then, of course, which ones? And if you're eating according to your metabolic type, you're doing pretty good. You know, tyrosine and, and uh, iodine deficiency are actually pretty rare. So dietary, uh, this is just my opinion, of course, having worked on a few people, that um, metabolic typing diet will, will be as close as your ancestors goes close to what your ancestors ate maybe 500 generations ago and th you, that's discoverable that is discoverable and, and even if you've interbred and intermixed and that's one of the problems of today's planet is is that you, people don't know their genetic diet type you know you hear a lot of talk about paleo and ancestral diets and i agree with that but which one you know, I'm I'm basically Irish English, and my ancestral diet is not going to be this, the same as a person from the island of Borneo. You know, just two different genetic types: the minerals that were in the soil, and therefore in the plants, and therefore in the animals that ate the plants, which we ate, would be different ratios. And over millennia, these become the genetic uh, foundations of you as an individual. You know, we're made of food. We're made of food. Well, you know, food matters then. And, uh, but as, and again, in terms of, I, I'm not a big proponent of uh, condition specific diets. I think there's one that's right for your metabolic type and it'll sort itself out. And as long as you also, and we can test for food sensitivities. And so those are easily tested for and you can eliminate them. So if you're eating your, your specific ancestral diet, with um and making sure you're not tyrosine and iodine deficient <laughs> you know there is such a thing as a goiter belt in this country in the u.s um so you eat according to your genetic type your metabolic type and then um get tested for food sensitivities it's really easy to do you could go through elimination diets if you want but um they're hard so i think you're I think you probably need to explain that a little bit, expound on this. You say there's a genetic um, diet, a diet that fits with your genetics and your ancestral background from five or 10,000, 5,000 years ago or whatever. Can you explain that to a greater degree? Yeah, sure. So there's, there's actually a, a technology, if you will, it's, it's um, coined a metabolic typing. I, there's a guy named Bill Wolcott. He wrote a, book, The Metabolic Typing Diet, and thankfully I found that almost 20 years ago, and I was in a, uh, a Borders bookstore, they don't have those anymore, used to be able to hang out, drink coffee, and read, like a free free library or something, but I bought six copies of that, I read it maybe a half an hour's worth, and I took six copies back to the office and handed them out, one of the doctors had already read it, and, and we just hit it off and I ended up meeting Bill Wolcott <clears throat> at the time he had a, a certification course in metabolic typing so th through a series of um, you can actually do it through uh, there's some objective testing you could do some people think that with the hair tissue mineral analysis and other ways you can discover your oxidative rate so that's an important key factual scientific element your people are, can lean towards being very fast oxidizers 
or very slow oxidizers. So that's the rate at which you are burning fuel. You're going to burn uh, mostly carbs and fats and some proteins to produce energy. So you th then therefore for each person that ratio of protein, fat and carbs is very, very important in terms of oxidizing, which means burning fuel to produce energy. Now that's on the cellular level and you don't have to teach cells what their job is. Again, back to the innate, there's an innate intelligence. A cell knows if it's in the adrenal glands or in the brain or a muscle cell or a bone cell. It, cells know what their job is. They just need to be actually fueled, they need to produce energy at the right rate and quality and quantity, which is basically determined by that percentage of protein, fat and carbs. Me, I'm a very fast oxidizer. So I need to eat slow burning fuel. I'll give you a good example of, of this, take a, a, a genetic type of uh, the North American native Indian. They're very fast oxidizers. So if you give them uh, high, diets high in carbohydrates, that's like paper burning on a, on a bonfire. They're never satisfied. They're really not producing energy doesn't mean they won't grow up. They're going to grow up with problems. And uh, my, my cousin's actually a priest up in Canada with two Cree Indian villages. That's his parishes. And they're all sick because they're not eating according to their native genetic metabolic type, if you will, diet. They eat at Tim Horton donuts and they eat spaghetti and stuff. They're not fishing and hunting, eating their natural diet anymore, which is very high in protein and fat, rich purine type things. So they aren't producing energy at a cell level and they're sick. I mean, that's right. the so, long and the short of it. Yeah, so hold on, let's, let's back up a second here. So um, the, the big challenge, so when we were saying that, hey, we're gonna eat based on our genetic phenotype from, you know, from our ancestors 5,000 years ago. Um, to some degree, you know, that, that diet doesn't exist anymore, right? That, that lifestyle doesn't necessarily exist anymore. And so to yep. tell somebody that, hey, you still need to follow that diet or you don't have the metabolic flexibility to adapt your diet, um, I don't know if I'm totally on board with all that, but I think one of the big issues that we see with people who are, or are sick today, uh, it seems to be you, maybe it's the fact that they're not following their genetic, uh, their initial genetic code, as you would say, or their metabolic code. But maybe the biggest issue is that more people today are eating, um, they're eating more processed food, they're moving, eating more chemically damaging or food that has more chemicals, toxicity, they're eating more minerally deficient food, and they're eating more foods that are that are out of season, force ripened, and have a higher toxic load and burden, maybe it doesn't have much to do or as much less to do today with what the genetic background is per se, but the toxicity of the foods that we're eating. So how do you bridge that gap? If, you're, if you have a, a diet that you're saying, hey, metabolically, this is the type of diet you're supposed to be following based on your genetics, um, and that, but that diet doesn't necessarily exist or is available to that person or the nutrients they're getting or the foods that they are supposed to be following are the foods that they're having reactivity to. How do you explain those? How do you explain that? Well, we're actually just right together. I mean, you, you just dialed in the problems in finding uh, that genetic diet. You know, let's pretend that it's available at the grocery store. It, it isn't exactly. And so there's knowing what that diet is. What is the uh, protein, fat, and carb ratios is discoverable. And then which ones would be, again, if they had the exact right combination of vitamins and minerals and essential fatty acids and amino acids and all the antioxidants and things. So you'd have to just, we're on the same page. It's just that I'm going back to, well, what would be the perfect diet for you as an individual, as a metabolic type, if you will, a phenotype, which you identify. Um, and then what's available? Well, what's available is a bunch of crap that doesn't match that. And that we're on this exact same page that that it's the standard American diet is full of um, chemicals and um, other toxic things. There's insecticides, pesticides, rodenticides, uh, and you name it. And so um, uh, 
we're on the same page. It's just that I, I really do believe there is a genetic diet that's right for you. And you can get as close as possible to that. And then your cells would be fueled properly and you'd have all the vitamins, minerals, essential fatty acids, antioxidants and things that would allow, give you a basis. So as much as you're made of food and you need all that to fuel cells and be healthy and happy and live a long time and all that, um, there is a right diet. But you, you, and you correctly identified that that's not what's on the shelves at the grocery stores. So there's a problem there. Fortunately, I grew up in Canada where my, both my grandfathers were, they grew food. We ate out of the backyard, rinsed it off in rainwater. And the soils didn't have a bunch of the stuff in it. They had actually vitamins and minerals. So you mentioned soils depletion, that there just isn't enough um, nutrition in the food. And I'm going to go back one step further and say, well, if you could get protein, fat, and carbs right, then you can start worrying about that's the macronutrients. Then you can start adding in the micronutrients and get the right minerals and these other things that matter. And so it, it just has to, we just have to agree it's possible to get there. And that what's in the way is that commercial uh, food, the way it's processed, you mentioned uh, forced ripening and all this. Yeah, all that's a factor. So um, I so think where we, yeah, yeah. We're, we're on the exact same page. So you talk about that there's this metabolic typing that you do so you can identify your, the appropriate diet for an individual. So what are those types of metabolic, what are the metabolic types that, you would, that you're explaining to people? I would start with the, the, the fast versus the slow oxidizer. We, we know there's certain, uh, peoples, let's say from South America and the Andes Mountains, it would be, they're slow oxidizers. They can live very healthy on a plant diet, more or less a, a plant-based diet. They're just genetically programmed that way. Their metabolic type would be slow oxidizer. So they don't do well on high fat and high purine type proteins because they don't burn it properly. They don't burn it efficiently and it just stinks up the place if you will and then i mentioned the cree indians that my cousin is a priest over um he he um just says they're all sick because they're supposed to be catching fish eating a lot of that protein and with the fat that comes up that. and the caribou that are up there that still take two a herd takes two hours to cross the road that you have to just park your car and wait for them to get but the food is still there now they would only be eating seasonal nut seeds and berries and things in the summertime they might dry a few and eat them in the winter but that's their genetically required diet it also from thousands and thousands of years has the they've just adapted to those minerals those um constituents in the soils and things so that's their prep proper genetic and when they eat differently they get diabetes and i, I want to say they all have diabetes but he did tell me they're all sick like they go to government clinics and get their medicine and what they really need to do is go back and look at the fact that they're very fast oxidizers they can't eat the um fast burning fuel like carbohydrates if you take an eskimo that's a classic example you can feed them the best salad in the world but they won't be satisfied they won't produce energy you know they won't be satiated and um they're probably going to feel pretty depressed too they will have no sense of well-being uh because they're on the wrong darn diet and that by the way gives us the clues doctor that we could use to see am i eating correctly so if you eat breakfast and it's right for your type, if it has the correct ratio of protein, fat, and carbs, then two hours later, your sense of satiation, satiety, that's a factor, would be met. You shouldn't be craving anything or feel like something was missing from your diet. You should also have really good, strong energy to get your work done or your play done or whatever it is to the next time you have to fuel up, eat. You know, so you, there should be a real high sense of satiety, nothing craving, nothing missing, real high sense of energy. And believe it or not, that sense of well-being, you, should be, you shouldn't be grumpy for no reason. You shouldn't be irritated or anxious or uh, these things because we start bringing in other elements like the autonomic nervous system and whether you're stimulating sympathetic versus parasympathetic, that's the next factor. But the first one is that oxidative rate matching up cellular energy production with those ratios. That's a good place to start in terms of your metabolic typing uh, and diet. So it's this, this idea of oxidation is no 
it's not something that was made up. It was discovered uh, and it's, it's a factor. So you have, there's two types. You're saying there's a fast oxidizer and a slow oxidizer, right? <laughs> Yes. Well, there's a middle. There, there's what we call a mixed oxidizer. And, and I could help you out with where you're going with that, I think, in that let's, let's say you, um, there, there's an online test you can take that will, it, it looks at uh, physical characteristics and psychological characteristics and dietary habits and things. And it, it gives you a general, you're a fast oxidizer, let's say. Now, you're going to have to dial that in, kind of like we used to do on the radio with uh, when when you went on a station, you'd you'd uh, you know turn it and you okay it sounds like really clear, and then we would just purposely go past it a little bit. Yeah, oops, it was back here. So you dial, you actually dial in that energy production, sense of satiation, and sense of well-being through experimentation. Again, two hours after you eat or an hour and a half should tell you whether the, your meal's working for you or not. If you're craving, something's wrong. If you feel grumpy for no reason, something's wrong. If you're not, uh, uh, if you don't have energy, something's wrong in just how you, f what kind of fuel that ratio that you put in your body. Now there are other factors that are affected by diet, and it's you know sympathetic versus parasympathetic. There are combinations of foods that will throw that out of whack. So you, and what I learned in chiropractic was that there's this idea of energy production. And then there's energy distribution and the sympathetic and parasympathetic. So you have people who could classify as dominant in one or the other. So besides energy production and the oxidative rate, we have distribution. Are foods actually stimulating the sympathetic? Well, if you're already sympathetic, you don't want to eat those. And me, I think, and maybe you, Doc, you, you know, you're a parasympathetic type, pretty laid back, you know, a lot of steady energy and um, even the ability to stay up late at night and work hard and things like that. And, um, but, you know, you're very, very steady and, and parasympathetic, good digestion uh, and these kind of things. Um, you don't want to eat too much food that stimulates the parasympathetic. You get kind of catatonic, you know. I know if I over eat certain foods, I don't have, you know, it's same thing. I just end up being too parasympathetic, too laid back and seem kind of dull. <laughs> so I have to keep my, you have to balance the autonomic nervous system as well. That's another part. And that's the other key part to metabolic typing. So you have your oxidative rate, you want to get that fast, slow, or mix. And you have the autonomic balance, which you want to be, you know, you could be sympathetic, parasympathetic, or, or somewhere in between. And it, it's important to know that food can affect you that seriously. And then um, everything else is downhill from there, I believe. You know, I mean, all things being equal, that you're resting and that you're exercising and reducing stress and and taking your supplements because as you mentioned food is pretty low quality these days how would you say that gut health or like the microbiome how how does that fit into your model of the food does that play a role in some of the foods that you know because sometimes you, you may recommend foods to certain patients and they can't digest it maybe at this point in time so how does gut health play a role in the type of diet that you recommend well, it's huge. It's probably the, the exact perfect place to go because it isn't always what you eat. Pretend you're eating this perfect diet, and some people doubt that it exists. I, I don't really doubt it much myself. Um, it might be hard to get your hands on and prepare every day and to eat that way in a disciplined fashion, but it's there. It's available. The next thing is, are you breaking it down and absorbing it? You know, assimilation is really the key. We've done uh, all kinds of exams on people, hair tissue mineral analysis, for instance, and they just are very low. Why? Because it isn't that they aren't eating good food. It's that they aren't breaking it down and absorbing it. So this is where the microbiome comes in, in a big way. So you need a, a balance in the gut to properly finish digesting and absorbing food. You know, you chew it you swallow it, acid kind of purifies it and liquefies it, things like that. And uh, you begin maybe some protein breakdown, but when it moves into the small intestine is where bacteria takes its own uh, action upon those food particles and really finalizes that along with the uh, enzymes that are in your brush border, the microvilli and 
the enzymes in the food itself, um, it gets further broken down to where it can be assimilated. And that's if you have a healthy gut. You know, so um, it gets really critical to keep that microbiome, um, or, you know, at least you don't want to be dysbiotic. There's, there's, if you have an abundance of the so-called bad flora, you're not going to get that breakdown and you're going to start missing out. You're actually going to become malnourished in a sense because you're not absorbing, especially amino acids. And look at the ramifications of, of that. I mean, you end up with um, neurotransmitter problems and so on and so on and so on. So I, I believe selecting the foods is the first thing and the, the ratios and stuff, but then of course, breaking it down, absorbing it, you know, it begins with the way you think about food and look at it and take time to prepare it and let your mouth water and chew it up, you know, the whole digestive system. We could spend a whole hour just on that, but um, it, it's remarkable. So when we're talking about, you're talking about a, 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 a diet that's, so you're looking at your, meta, your metabolic typing of your diet, whether you're a fast oxidizer, mixed oxidizer, or slow oxidizer, that's going to determine what your diet should be, your ratio of proteins, carbohydrates, and fats, right? And so, yes, sir. and then you're, we're, as Dr. Erica was kind of saying, hey, this can be influenced. Is there a role that your gut flora plays? Because you might be, maybe you are a fast oxidizer and it, it, you require a certain diet, but if the gut biome is not such that it can uh, process the foods on that diet, now you're, now you're in a real challenge. If we're looking at dietary factors, and how we process food based on our, our kind of our lineage, right? We're not, most of us aren't in the area where our lineage and our, and our gut flora changes based on where we are in the environment and what we do and the toxicity and the, and the burden we put on the system. Yeah. So what's the, where's the, where's the hierarchy? I guess that what I'm trying to do is we have patients who are going to listen and people that are listening to this podcast and saying, okay, what is what's the impact here for me? I'm I'm I have I've been diagnosed with hypothyroid. Now we're talking about diet nutrition. Your what where from from Reed Davis's standpoint? How does a person who has hypothyroidism determine what their diet should be? And I think what you're saying is well, the first thing you need to do is establish whether you're a fast, slow, or mixed meta oxidizer. The person who's hypothyroid is probably going to say, "I'm, I'm slow. I'm, I get, I'm sl My metabolism is slow, so my processes, all those processes, are, are going to be compromised to some degree." But where does somebody who's on, who's the person who's got a diagnosis, and I really don't care what the diagnosis is because I don't think hypothyroid right. is the primary thing, but it's the body's adaptive response to chronic cellular stress. So where does a person from we, from Reed's perspective, somebody saying, okay, but what are you recommending I do as a person who's struggling with chronic health issues or thyroid issues? Where, where am I going? Am I concerned about my gut biome? Am I concerned about my diet? Am I concerned about where, where am I starting in this process of, hey, find out if you're an oxidizer, fa mixed, fast, or, or slow. What if that doesn't match up with what I can eat? What am I supposed to do? Well, you know, sometimes you, you, when it, we got into the diet because the question was, how does food affect the thyroid? The same way it affects every other cell tissue and organ in your system. You have to fuel the cells properly. That's how we got off kind of into the fast, slow mix. And then there's another aspect, the autonomic dominance. And you can, there are foods that would stimulate one or the other. That's just the basic remedy or, or formula for diet, which is a foundational, obviously a pillar of health. Now, when you get into people who haven't been eating that way and they are eating, again, you mentioned the toxicity and the chemicals and all these things, they have a lot of chaos in their body. That, that bad diet is a stressor. So go back to where we, we talked about mental, emotional stress, physical stress and trauma, and then chemical and biochemical trauma, these are stress, those three major stress. Well, bad food is a major stressor. Now, if you couple that with they've got physical pain and, you know, injuries built up and nerve interference and things like that, and then they've also got uh, mental, emotional problems, they're just 
kind of in a downward spiral. And you mentioned the microbiome is critical. The hormones are critical. People who are under stress, the body doesn't care where the stress is coming from. You have a stress response and it's going to elevate your cortisol, at least initially. And cortisol is catabolic. Cortisol breaks your body down. You look at a long distance runner and they're, they're so stressed out that they've eaten all the meat off their bodies. You know, they've just been catabolic and they've, they've, you know, dissipated uh, muscular musculature. So we know that stress is a huge factor. Where regardless of where it comes from, your body responds the same way with this catabolic to anabolic Im another imbalance. We have the fast slow imbalance. We have this uh, autonomic imbalance. Another major homeostatic control or fundamental homeostatic control would be that cortisol to DHEA ratio. So you know. They're both producing the adrenals in different zones of the adrenals, but so um, you know, one cortisol, oh, stress, man, it's a um, stress helps you. It's anti-inflammatory. It's a painkiller, and it controls your blood sugar. You want more blood sugar, especially to the brain when you're under stress. So you need oh, cortisol. Give me some of that. It's an adaptive survival thing. But you also need to balance it out with the anabolic. Your body needs to build back up after you break it down. So you need a lot of good, strong DHEA and the other you know, that's apparent your sex hormones and so on and so on. And the, the thyroid is affected by all that too. Matter of fact, sometimes we have a hard time figuring out, is it is it adrenal, cortisol, DHA, sex hormones, or, you know, which came first? And to me, it doesn't matter a whole lot because um, you're going to, the, the quote unquote self-treatment or treatment for is all the same. Number one, you have to eat right. Number two, you have to get a lot of good sleep, you know, real high quality, deep sleep, at least four or five hours a night of deep sleep. So diet and rest and exercise, you have to move your body. And then all those various stressors we talked about, you, you want to identify them. You can look at the foods you're sensitive to. You can look at the microbiome. You could have a dysbiosis or a lot worse, parasites and bacteria and fungi and things like that. And then I believe in taking supplements because food just isn't good enough. And supplements can also be used to stimulate or support certain organs or, uh, again, substitute what's missing in food. So this idea of diet, rest, exercise, stress reduction supplements is a treatment for low adrenal, low thyroid, everything. I'm not a physician. I don't want to treat a specific thing. I want to bring these elements of these general principles of health building to affect every cell, tissue, and organ. It's what it's the only thing my it's in my scope of practice, if you will, as a, as a, uh, now, now people are calling themselves professional health coaches and a lot of chiropractors and acupuncturists and even MDs are, are lining up to just use epigenetic. You know, it's applied epigenetics. It's every factor that could, uh, make you healthier or make you unhealthy. So I know that's a big answer to what you said, but I think we're on the exact same page. I, what, what you guys are doing is, is your, I think the term now is like biohacking, you know, and what's the, how, if you lived yourself into a problem, how do you live yourself out of it? You know, aside from infectious diseases and broken bones and tra other trauma, that's what we need to be focused on. Yeah. I, I, I guess what, what we need to do is we, I think the key things that we're talking about, and we talked about the talk about this on the podcast on a regular basis is at the root of, uh, what's challenging people is excessive levels of persistent chronic cell stress that puts the cell into a danger response. So when we talk about stress, stress isn't good. It's not, it's not necessarily bad. It's not necessarily fantastic to have lots of stress, but really what is the balance of stress? We need some level of stress because it's hormetic. It actually helps us get stronger. So some level of stress, have that stress go away. The body adapts to the stress, we recover from the stress, and now we're bigger, stronger. Just like training for a race, a marathon, or any type of event, you gotta have some level of stress, be able to adapt to it, recover from it, that makes us stronger. So there's a hormetic effect to almost everything. Yep. And then I think what you're, what you're saying, the other part of that is, so it's not necessarily just, let's get rid of all stress, because people will look, look at you and laugh at you and say, yeah, that's not happening. But what we do need to do is have a better balance of, a good stress versus bad stress, right? You stress versus distress uh, yeah. and balance things out. And then the way to have the least amount of stress 
negative excessive stress on the body is to really look at diet and lifestyle factors and those are the things that eric and i talk about all the time and it is diet now whether um everybody's got different opinions on this and some people say paleo vegan whatever listen <laughs> our argument is not whether those diets uh, are right or wrong everybody's got to adapt to the diet that fits them best for what they're doing time and lifestyle you may say they need to fit what fixes best with their genetic predisposition, which is fast, mixed, or slow, but everybody's uh, diet, their lifestyle, their environment, their training, what they're doing uh, is going to tailor potentially their ability to utilize a different diet at different times of their life. Um, so I think we have to take that into consideration. Yes. But the key is, is that we need to all the diet and lifestyle factors, sleep, rest, breathing, respiration, microbial stress, metabolic stress, chemical and environmental stressors, uh, trauma, emotional thought process, the, the, your habitual fitness, your, um, your mindset and your happy level of happiness, all of these things uh, that pretty much you have control of are the things that determine to a large de degree how healthy you're going to be and how functional or dysfunctional. And then I think the last piece that sums up what you were kind of saying was, hey, we have all of these systems that we start to see potentially create having problems or challenges or what some might call as disease or dysfunction. My opinion, and I think Erica would agree with me and we'll get your opinion on this too, is that what we see so often and we call sickness, illness, disease and disorder is really the body's adaptation to the excessive persistent chronic stress that's unrelenting that shifts us out of what we call homeostasis or a non-stress regulating system into what we call a stress regulating system which is something called allostasis and if you stay in mm -hmm. a or allostatic state too long then that triggers breakdown what we call allostatic overload and that is essentially what we see as disease and the challenge in allopathic medicine is they're often looking at people from that chronic allostatic overload perspective and trying to, to help them survive and manage this allostatic overload and where functional medicine is different is we're trying to say, great, you need crisis care if you need it, that's, but that's not healthcare. That's disease management, that's crisis management. We wanna get back to the what caused that to begin with. So are you do you agree with those points do you see something 100 percent. yeah N no i think that's why we're talking is because we look at it exactly the same way um th there's use stress which is the good kind that would be the kind that forces the um the you know the 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 little rascal to make his cocoon and then come out a butterfly, you know, like if you snip open the, the cocoon and he, and you don't stress the, the, uh, the caterpillar out, the, the juices don't go out into the wings. So, you know, the little boy who let the uh, caterpillar out of his cocoon before he was ready, you know, it couldn't fly, you know, so there's you stress, there's good stress. You can't build muscle if you don't stress them out to some degree and things so but distress predominance is what i think we're we're dealing with here and that allostatic load uh my friend bill wolcott who did the metabolic typing diet book um talks about you take a, a board and put it on two sawhorses and start adding bricks well life is kind of like that sometimes you add bricks and you're adding bricks and you're adding bricks pretty soon that board's gonna start to bend and then it, you put more bricks on it, it's gonna start to you know, crack, you're going to hear like little fibers breaking and things like that. And, you know, if you keep putting bricks on there, uh, you know what the inevitability is, something breaks. And so our, our job would be to kind of uh, remove the bricks, you know, and let health be expressed. And that's why I, I love chiropractic and, and, you know, getting the body in, in perfect alignment or close. And, you know, at our office, we did a lot of x-rays of crooked spines. These people were never healthy you know because they had that type of stress and then that's what led me to do the uh, all the study you we're seeing the exact same things i just have a way of organizing it that worked for me in my office i worked in a office for 10 years and i just was again with mentorship and running labs and looking at things i just started to categorize it so that i could remember it 
you know, I like to be able to, that's why when I talk about the, the healing opportunities, I use the word hidden. H-I-D-D-N is hormone, immune, digestion, detoxification, energy production, and the nervous system balance. H-I-D-D-E-N. It's just, just easy. That's why I'm able to have these conversations and they just flow because I've got it in my head categorized, you know. And then the solution for every cell, tissue, organ, and system is D-R-E-S-S. -S. That's your lifestyle. That's your epigenetic program. It's diet where we start rest, exercise, stress reduction, and supplementation. So it just, it's just, you, we're saying the exact same things. I just came up with a way of organizing it, that it's a construct that works. And I know you have yours. So we're, we're really on the same page, all three of us and the listeners. Absolutely. Yeah, I think the, the, big, the biggest issue is, I think that, and it doesn't necessarily matter um, in this space, from, in this functional medicine space, who you talk to, the foundational principles are pretty much the same. You know, do the best you can with, that you can with diet and lifestyle. Uh, if you want to be healthier, have a healthier, have a higher level of fitness in all those things you're talking about, structural fitness, physical fitness, emotional fitness, um, habitual fitness, respiratory fitness, you know, all those aspects of your life make sure those things are as optimal as you can. Identify as many of the stressors as you can, reduce them or remove mm -hmm. them. And then if you reduce or remove them, support the repair and manage your fitness levels, which are the typically the things that cost you the least, uh, yeah. the chances that you're, gonna be the, that you're gonna be a healthier person down the line is pretty good. So I agree. I think most of us in this space are all on the same page. We have a different way of saying things, maybe a different way of um, determining what we think is the best or the most appropriate for somebody. However, um, the foundational principles, and that's what I want the listeners to go away with. What Eric and I talk about on a regular basis is diet, nutrition, exercise, do all these foundational things first before you start looking for the super supplement or the super special yeah. task. Um, or even maybe even considering reaching out to a functional medicine practitioner. I don't think if it's you or me or Erica or anybody else, if they came to us on a you know, standard American fast food diet, one of the first things we're going to do is make that, uh, make a change to that kind of dietary idea. Let's get the processed foods out. Let's get the high sugar, poor, you know, damaged fat foods out of the diet. Let's go to a healthy diet. And we can argue what that, what that healthy diet is for each individual, but these are right. the very basic concepts that we all typically agree with is it's not whether you're exactly right or I'm exactly right or Eric is it, that's not the point. The point is there's foundational concepts to be healthy and they all revolve around things for the most part uh, that we have pretty, that we have a lot of control over less than we used to maybe but that we all can make some changes and have some control over. And most of them are free. And that's the things where I think we, Eric and I really want people to understand is, Hey, you don't have to spend, um, you know, thousand dollars, $2,000 on testing. If you haven't done some of the simple things first, do those simple, straightforward things, not always easy, but definitely simple things first because those are the things that once you clean them up, you could see dramatic changes in your health. Yeah, I agree uh, wholeheartedly, you know, in, in a sense, uh, we're all, um, you and me and Erica, you know, we're, we're walking the talk too, you know, I mean, I'm a client of a couple, you know, and a patient and stuff. I can't adjust myself and I certainly can't adjust someone else. So it takes, a, I think a team, it doesn't mean you have to spend a ton of money. You just have to pay attention. I think we would agree on that, that like if you pay attention, like, like aches and pains matter and gas and heartburn and bloating matter. They, you know, you start to, you know, if you go to a physician and he says your blood work looks normal, go to someone else who, who understands that those are um, subclinical or pre precursors to what could end up being a real problem later. So you will need, like I have a personal trainer, 
I have an acupuncturist. I have a chiropractor. I'm kind of my own nutritionist. But again, I, I have mentors who are smarter than me. And so I just try to use, it takes a, it takes a village to <laughs> raise a healthy person you know, or something like that. You know, you just you, you get your little team around you. And, and you mentioned the one thing that I often forget, just emotionally, I, I don't have, um, I get up every day just kind of glad to be here you know I was one of those kids that that jumped on his bed when he got out of bed I just jumped and jumped until someone told me quit quit being so happy all the time you know but so I forget about that component but yeah I think you and you just mentioned it and I'm glad you did because having that um, support group around you of just other someone else who cares who like will go to a lecture with you hey i want to go to a lecture on gut dysbiosis will you come with me you know that's really an important thing so you so we're just so on the same page here okay you look like you're nodding your head agreeing with that yeah no i do i do agree i think that the the emotional part of it and and trying to be you know i think when people are feeling like they're sick or they have whether it's hypothyroidism or whatever condition it may be they often get really down and you can keep digging your own grave essentially where you just keep going in that hole deeper and deeper and deeper and so sometimes you know realizing you know it could be worse it could be worse than you know you know what so and so is dealing with and realizing that there is gratitude that there is a light at the end of the tunnel and that there are things that you can do to change your destiny and so often people who are diagnosed with hypothyroidism believe that that's a death sentence or you know, oh, I'm going to have to deal with this forever. I'm always going to just be tired or not be able to be with my kids or have to, you know, struggle with all these health challenges. And it doesn't have to be that way. I think that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. And I think that having that hope and gratitude and knowing that there are people out there, like all three of us that, that can help guide you. I think that is, that's really important. Yeah. Good. All right. Very well, good. I think we've, I think we've, uh, I think we've kind of come to our, our end of our time together and we, uh, we, we appreciate you coming on and having a, Thank a you. discussion about this, uh, you know, kind of this topic. Um, so if somebody's got an interest, in, if they're a practitioner or somebody who's got an interest in learning more about functional diagnostic nutrition um, and what is taught in your program, where would they go? Well, I think uh, my staff here told me to mention uh, fdn.today slash thyroid answers. And we'll, we'll give you a three-step guide. I talked about running the labs and at least some kind of investigation into the hidden stressors and designing a custom dress protocol, the DRESS lifestyle thing. And then step three would be implementing that. So this three-step guide is available at fdn.today forward slash thyroid answers and that is for um today's podcast or um webinar great all right well we're going to wrap this up if you have an interest uh we'll put the the link in the show in the show notes so if you want to go check that out you can do that uh reed once again we appreciate you coming on everybody have a fantastic day and if you're a listener or viewer of the podcast definitely wherever you li- download your podcast go give us a review I think there's stars. Is that right, Erica? There's stars on that thing. I believe and if it. If you go is. to the far right star, that's usually the best one to check. Is that correct? Whatever's the most. <laughs> yeah, the one. I think it's the far right. So I would check the far right one and then share the podcast with your friends and family. And then lastly, for anybody who uh, wants more information, uh, we, I think I've talked about, I think I posted this, but uh, the Thyroid Debacle, which is the book that Kel- Dr. Kelly Halderman and I have coming out this summer, uh, is now available on pre-order. Just go to, you know, Barnes and no- or Barnes and Noble's not there anymore, I guess, right? Barnes and Noble is still there. Yeah. Amazon's still there, but you can definitely go to those types of places and put in your pre-order and get your copy ordered today. So we'll wrap this up again. Reed, thank you so much, Dr. Erica. You guys, you have a fantastic day. Both of you guys have a great day. And uh, stay tuned for uh, another episode of Thyroid Answers coming to you soon. All right. Take care. Thank you.